Good morning, welcome, thank you for joining us um, and welcome along to this not to be missed live edition um, of what we're calling the No Fluff Zone. Um, the, the title of this broadcast is No Fluff, Just Suff Inside a Winning B2B Campaign. I'm delighted to say um, joining me is our Senior Account Director, Tom. Good morning, uh, Tom. Morning. Uh, if you're a CMO or a marketer, and you're looking to crack the code on B2B lead generation on social media right now, which we know is a lot of you. The statistics tell us how many of you have this as a priority right now. But if you are one of those that's trying to make your way, please do sit tight. Uh, we're about to dissect a series of campaigns. So this isn't a one-off hit on a single campaign, a one-off hit on a piece of content. This is hypothesis that we've been shaping for many, many years that we've taken to market and proven across many campaigns that has significantly shifted the needle. You are going to hear statistics like um, a plunging cost per click by 58%. You're going to hear statistics like doubling cost per click just by changing um, a video format. And if you start looking at the channels where your audience really are, you could see engagements quadruple, you could see clicks go up by hundreds, and you can also see engagements increase by tens of thousands. And this isn't just vanity metrics. We're going to talk to you about how we've then nurtured that into delivering marketing qualified leads and ultimately through lead score into sales qualified leads. But a lot of you are struggling to actually get the early stuff up front. So a bit of context and the whole reason we got Tom along to, to talk to you um, the, this morning. Um, B2B lead generation is a beast of its own, especially in today's climate. The buyer journey has become a labyrinth with 75% of B2B marketers focusing more on demand gen than lead generation. And then, I mean, we haven't even spoken about ROI yet. I mean, half of us are in the dark about what we should be measuring accurately. What is a, a, a good metric of success? What should we be paying back to the business? Or is it purely about those form fills and downloads, are we pulling form fills up too early? Are we nurturing audience? Are we giving away the right stuff? Are too many of you shoving content behind the gate and not opening it up? We're going to get into all of that. Many of you will know the pandemic changed how we talk about digital adoption. It has meant more of us are online, great opportunity. It's meant more of us in social, great opportunity, but it has turned LinkedIn into what we think is a metaphorical equivalent of Oxford Circus on a Saturday in December when everyone out at Christmas shopping, it is bombarded with attention. Right, that's enough for me. Let's get Tom talking. Um, let's pick up on that saturation for the marketers because a lot of the people watching this will be thinking, my audience are on LinkedIn, Tom. I need to get content out there. But why are we so worried about that crowded space and what concerns us about this LinkedIn saturation we speak of? Well, I think um, we know, I think as you kind of alluded to, with all the roles that we've got on, well, that we know are present on social in terms of CFOs, CMOs, um, we know the crowded Oxford Circus analogy kind of makes sense because obviously these people are on, on there quite regularly, but they're being bombarded by notifications about um, connections, uh, profile views, um, you know, all, all these kind of random things, in-mails, all these kind of stuff. So I think if, if we think about carving out space, it, it's almost not possible, right? So what you've got to do is try and stand taller, right? Maybe get on the shoulders of someone and, and try and stand out a little bit more. Um, and that's that's not always going to be, that's not always going to be easy. But obviously it comes back, it comes back to content, right? It comes back to what, what, what you create and it comes back to your value offering. Now, this is such basic stuff. I'm sure there's people watching this now who are thinking, well, well obviously. Um, but I think when it when it comes to something like like LinkedIn and, and something that we see quite regularly is that we do see the, the typical sort of corporate content. We do see the typical um, product facing stuff. We do see the stuff that doesn't really lend itself to a nudge nurture philosophy, which we'll come on to a little bit more. Um, there's not a lot of value add. There's not a lot of um, learnings given up for free. There's not a lot of um, information sharing. A lot of it is it can be product led. A lot of it is quite ambiguous. So what the main focus that we had, and we'll come on to their campaigns more specifically, is tapping into things that maybe resonate with people on a more personal level, 
not just at a business level. And um, we'll come into that a, a little bit more. But um, yeah, I, th I think when we come to talk about the the campaigns that we've worked on, we'll talk about video, we'll talk about how we reformatted them, we'll talk about what we filmed, uh, and we'll talk about how we set things out across a long period of time. Um, because there's no there's no quick solution to, to getting those leads and, and getting all that traffic to where you want it to go, unless you're willing to be patient and build trust with an audience. Can um, pick up on some data which actually helps with this um, challenge that we have around just how saturated LinkedIn is. And part of that is because we all think our audience are on LinkedIn and that's where the buyers are and that's where the CXOs are. But look at this, GWI data evidence that meta channels have significantly more active daily CXOs than LinkedIn. Now, for disclosure, we are talking in the case of uh, this customer, they are a major technology company, one of the world's um, top 10 technology companies and they're a top five technology partner. So the CXOs we refer to here are in the technology space, but the bit you must pay attention is the active daily users. Just because a CXO is on LinkedIn doesn't mean that they're active. They kind of jump in, do something and come out. Something you said to me earlier, Tom, which really stuck with me is forget the purpose of what where, where they, they are socially. If they're spending more time on a meta platform and you can stand out and resonate, doesn't that make more sense? And you certainly took some of that thinking into this campaign in, in encouraging the client to actually look more at Facebook than LinkedIn, didn't you? Yeah, without giving too much away early on, it, it, what we do, we do know from information, obviously Facebook's been around for a very, very long time. Right? We do know the connections between those that are on LinkedIn are gonna be on Facebook. Now, one of the main questions people are gonna be having when watching this is, and they may have had the same problems themselves, is okay, but I can't target that CXO on Facebook, or I can't target that brand, or I can't, be sure that I'm going to be able to have my content relevant for the platform. And I think um, I think with this, this particular campaign was that we tried to move away from focusing on what's appropriate for platform and think about what's appropriate for, for that person's you know mind and what, what people are going through at the moment. If we think about the client that we did this with, um, they obviously operate in multiple verticals. They sell multiple, multiple uh, products in, into different areas. But our focus in, in terms of the early nudge nurture process was to make sure that we're not selling a product, we're just selling what they understand and we're selling their knowledge. Now we'll come into how the filming was done in a bit, but we looked at when, when we looked at the content that was produced, it talks about AI, it talks about technology, conversations around government came into it, conversations around climate came into it. Now it doesn't matter whether you're you know, you're at work or you're at home on the sofa waiting for the ad break to finish. These things are in your mind constantly. Sometimes they're dormant. Sometimes you're thinking about them more and more. Um, whether you're a CXO and you've gone onto LinkedIn or Facebook, you're not thinking I'm 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 on these platforms. Sometimes if you go onto LinkedIn and you see a picture of a dog or a baby, you might wonder why. But it doesn't matter because essentially you are your mind is open to all of these things that are going on in the world right now. And your, your brand doesn't have to be tied to its specific product and doesn't have to be tied to exactly what it's selling. Always in the nudge and nurture process, as you know, is you're selling your trust and you're selling your knowledge. Your knowledge doesn't have to be outright upfront, everything about what you're selling. What do you know about the sector? What do you know about the problems that people might be facing? And overall, how can you be memorable? Um, I, I just I, I have, just get a bit frustrated sometimes when you see brands thinking well we can't put that here we can't put this there like that that doesn't make sense or you know we we need our audience to know about this but the, the problem is your audience aren't thinking about you most of the time they, they don't they don't care about you most of the time when they go on their platform if they're on linkedin they're on facebook yeah. most of the time you're not going to look for anything in particular sometimes you are but most of the time you're going on with a kind of dormant mindset i've got time to kill i've got a train i'm waiting for there's a train i'm on or i've got some time to waste so entertain me. My mind is open. I want to learn. I want to understand what's going on. And if you're if you're pushing a um, a product that's incredibly niche and something that you know, I don't care what the product name is, means nothing to me. I it's not going to be memorable, right? I got a pr prime example this morning. I mean, for those for those of you who are, go on LinkedIn, you probably know a lot about Stephen Bartlett and the content that he puts up, right? I won't say what I saw on, on him this morning. You should go and check out for yourself. I'm not going to mention this on a <laughs> call. But 
had nothing to do with the B2B sector, right? And it had nothing to do with, most of his content has nothing to do with helping you do your job better, right? He's talking about mental health. He's talking about diet. He's, he's speaking to celebrities who just want an hour of martyrdom to basically get stuff off their chest. None of it has anything to do with how it helps your business, but he gets a heck of a lot of engagement, a heck of a lot of interaction. And yes, that's him. That's his brand. But there's no reason why you can't be doing something not exactly the same, but on a similar level that ultimately is memorable and resonates with people. That's all at the beginning. That's what we're touching on at the moment. So we're not at that lead gen phase yet. We're just talking about building that knowledge and the understanding that you have and being able to promote stuff that is interesting and connects with people on a day to day basis. It doesn't matter what you're selling. You can do it. You can find a hook and you can find a way to do it. That resonance part's really interesting. And I know that the early resonance in video is one of the reasons um, that, that you drove such compelling completion rates on a specific um, series of content. So um, filming flipped into short form animations and short form edits across the campaign. I think I've got this right, Tom, but correct me if I'm wrong. You ran at a 22% average video completion rate on the, the campaign. And we're talking films that are 30, 40 seconds long in duration, just mm. to be honest with people. And one of the films peaked at 33% completion rate. So that's not a three second view. That's not a 10 second view. That's not people scrolling and it registering and those really crap yeah. rubbish metrics of a video view. This is high intent people that have consumed everything. How yeah. important was the resonance part that you've just spoken about in grabbing attention to drive the completion rates, do you think? It's basically everything, right? If you, if uh, We'll talk again. I, I don't want this to come across as disjointed so far, but basically we'll come on to why the video is filmed and what we did. But CJ alluded to vertical there, and we'll come into why that's so important with everything being mobile first, right? But when we looked at the videos, you know, we, we did we did some filming and um, we filmed some experts talking generally about the situation regarding uh, this particular company's area in, 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 in their sector. And um, we just let the conversation flow. Now, we had an hour, an hour and a half long video, which we know that full length video is going on YouTube where people can watch it in full. Um, and it, it lends itself to a well produced, you know, back to front. Here's a full story, full tale kind of kind of video we know and you all know that that's not useful for social you know you're not no one's looking for award-winning two-minute videos that tell a story from back to front unless you've got a really cool maybe animation story that's quite unique so with these videos we looked at shattering down an hour-long clip we we got maybe 15 to 20 different segments um and these were interesting sound bites that once again none of them talk about the brand none of the conversation talks about what they sell none of them talks about um how they help or, or their presence we've just got a bunch of intelligent people in a room to talk about their understanding and their knowledge and what we did was we looked into these short two to three minute clips where we have a wraparound topic and i want to go back to stephen bartlett again one of the reasons that he pulls everybody in is he's got that really impactful opening four to six seconds where he's got powerful captions with topics and content that resonates and we look to do the same thing and a lot of these topics talked about you know ai and um you know global warming and government like these are all buzzwords they're deep in your in your in your mind and when you see them pop on large captions by the way not your typical just small captions we have to have captions on social la 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 we put them out pretty big and bold so that they were seen when they when when we were scrolling such a simple and effective method but it's no surprise that this was the video content that performed so well because they were short clips and we made sure we focused on the first five to eight seconds to pull people in most effectively before playing the video through on full with more context behind what was being said. Um, and that, that was a good way of sort of uh, getting attention. And obviously for quite a few members of the audience, it was a case of just watching it all the way through. Um, hopefully, without realizing they were watching a you know thirty second or a one minute clip, um, that it was uh, that it was so engaging that they they watched all, all the way through. So we we took we've definitely taken some learnings from that. I'd encourage anyone to go and look at your own metrics about video completions, and when you see them, you'll understand why these statistics are are so standout. If you were to ask me the the, the key, 
you, look, everyone wants to do bold social media. It's one of the mantras of the immediate future. And I have not met a stakeholder yet who has said, no, I want to do boring content. But here's the thing. Lots of people say they want to do it and very few then walk it. They get caught up in concerns about what will brands say and how does this reflect on leadership? We have a client that lives, give us bold content. So even when there's a provocative conversation going on, AI, is it really the revolutionary uh, technology enabler or is it just causing ethical messes a across the world? We were allowed to go in front of that question and actually ask insightful people as as a case in point. And then once that's bridged, you're naturally talking about how AIs can impact category, opportunity, market share, revenues. So it comes back to the enabler story at the right time, which then ladders to the demand generation. But CXOs are worried about, well, should we have an AI? Is it going to change the business? Is it just going to cost us a fortune? Is it going to create an ethical mess? These are valid questions. So if you as a brand aren't helping the CXOs come to a, an opinion or an understanding around it, you're missing a vital opportunity. And that's just one example of what you can do across industry. I know, Tom, you wanted to pick up on some of the ROI challenges that CXOs face at the moment. Yeah, I think one of the questions we always, well, we don't always get, but perhaps we're always having to think about as marketers is ROI when it comes to a campaign. And it's it's always difficult because I think with enough data that we get now, right, it's not the old times where you had either newspaper display ads, billboard advertising or radio advertising. You had no ROI there. There was no way of explaining it. It was all awareness advertising. You know, you, you didn't have a, a billboard with a QR code that was scanned. You didn't have any of this. So with social, there's more to drill in. You can see how every penny is being spent with cost per click and everything like that. Um, I think when we look at the specifics of ROI, of a particular campaign, yes, you've obviously got your main aim. So if you set out a campaign where you're thinking of, oh, well, I want to drive traffic to this landing page because I want to get registration or I want to increase our followers or I want to get video views or I want to do, you know, there's always an intention with, with a lot of these campaigns. But there's so much data that's being produced that you can paint a picture however you like. You know, it might be easy to look at a high cost per click on, on um, on website visits and people go oh that cost per click way too high that that's not good that means it didn't serve its purpose but your audience isn't necessarily thinking the same way you are for all you know what what you shared on social before the website visit was a highly in interesting animation perhaps the copy was really interesting perhaps they didn't follow you and now they do follow you so always measure the other elements the other clicks um the video completions with their comments with their engagements you know, if it's a lead gen campaign, for example, you know that your leads might not be huge. But if you look at lead gen forms opened, which is a metric you can measure on LinkedIn, you might see that hundreds of people open them, in which case that tells you that actually the content did perform well. There was a buffer somewhere that was maybe out of your control. So it's a difficult question to answer because you can look at ROI on top line and go, what was the intention? Did it work? Or you can drill into the data a little bit more and say, well, actually, well, we didn't get this working. There was a lot of interest in these other segments or other elements of it perform really really well so all i'd say is that it, don't lean entirely on what you're doing is like the video thing we've just spoken about the aim was to sort of drive traffic to website but what we did realize of course was that yes it's video content we want to see what the video views were we wanted to see how well it performed but the key thing we spoke about at the beginning was how much traffic it drove to website. That wasn't even the intention initially. The, the intention was to build awareness and just get people watching the video. But what we found was most of the drop off, I think, came around the 25, 50 percent mark, which is very common, I imagine, for videos. But people have obviously seen enough and then wanted to go through to the website. So you, you just need to look at your data of your ad performance and you can paint your own picture. Because I know that you're going to have senior people in C-suite or director level that are going to be asking those questions about, well, how much did we get then? How much? How many leads did we get? How many website visits did we get? And I think if you if you lean on that solely and it's performed well, great, you've got something to report back, but you can also look at other things that also did well. So that's a that's a long answer with not a not one <laughs> in single answer. Um, my advice is don't look at ROI of a campaign based on one singular thing because there's, there's so much you can look at and you can learn from. Um, this comes back to a key philosophy and you referenced earlier on nudge nurture right so the people are watching this thinking i need demand gen i need i need clicks i need traffic to site everything you're saying yes give me some of those videos with 
33% completion rates. I'll have some of that. But all my board are really caring about right now is driving market share revenue and showing how we're spending our budget and getting a return on it. And I get all of that. But here's the thing with social media and any regular viewers of Serious Social Live will uh, would have heard Casey, Bell, myself and many others say this many, many times over the years. If you just put a form fill up, a single asset, one post, here's a great report, here's a single statistic, download a report, I promise you, you are going to fail. Right? You will have such a low click-through rate. But the, the, the nudge-nurture philosophy that Tom's talking about is broken down into nine touch points because data shows us you need between five and nine touch points to deliver a conversion. And a conversion is a value exchange, a, a, an email value exchange, where you understand who the prospect is in return for them taking a, a report or a round table attendance or a webinar sign up, I mean, quite, quite common conversions. But it could take you as many as nine assets to get to that point. The first uh, few assets, and I, I, although I can't sort of screen share, I've got something on my, my desktop at the moment, which I'll, I'll refer to. The first uh, one to three assets are what we call the trigger post. This is where you're driving resonance, where you're establishing in the audience mind your credibility, your understanding of the marketplace, your understanding of their position. So when Tom was talking to you about those 22% completion rates on average and the peak of 33%, that's showing high intent, high resonance on the trigger assets. Posts numbered four through to sort of six, seven, this is what we call the nudge nurture. So the what and the how did your business deliver the impacts and um, deliver on some of those statements that, that you, you've made. And you should lead with why orientated content at this part, because psychologically we process that better, although we still need to understand the how to fully understand what a business does. And you have to land all of those posts before you start hitting with the value exchange request. LinkedIn will sell you form fills on a single ad set. They'll take your money, they will give you it, they'll allow you to crack on, but what they won't tell you, and here's the frustration, their strategic team, when pressed, will answer this. They know that the performance on a single ad set is virtually non-existent. You need the nudge nurture piece up. Hell, go and take a look at some of their webinars. They will tell you this five to nine touch point stuff, but they still sell you a form fill on a single asset. And that's really frustrating because that's not understanding the business and putting your needs, your needs first. Um, one of the questions we regularly get asked, and I just wanted to pick up on it. With so many people um, doing demand generation, why did we focus on it to deliver standout content? This is where we're going to stand a little egotistical. When I, I, when I, when I say this, it's not a personal attack on B2B marketers, but there's, there's an onus on us telling you a reality, a truth to what's going on in industry, right? And you need to hear the reality of it. While 75% of people are focusing on it, oh, it is a very lean digit, the number of people that are doing it well and doing it right. People are just taking content from a brochure or, or an event and putting it up. They shatter content thinking, well, that's important. I see posts of come and say hi at stand whatever so that we can pitch you a concept and get a business card for a lead. Right? It, here's a reality, guys. Nobody other than your own employees or your best client that you already have a relationship with has ever come to your stand and gone, hi, saw your post on social and I've come to say, it just doesn't, it's wasted time. As is taking brochures fit for other mediums, shattering them and putting them in the social. It's not social first content. It is content. It might have the gems in it. It might have a statement in it. It might have a statistic in it, which you should use, but it needs to be social first content. And that's where we're going to move um, the, 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 the conversation on to because I'm going to get Tom to talk to you about why it's not LinkedIn anymore and I'm going to show you some statistics from content performances of how we took a 16 by 9 film, a traditional film that he said put it in LinkedIn, what was the metric? When we flipped it to vertical, what was the increase in metric? And then what happened when we took it into meta targeted? And we're going to share all that, that with you. Mm -hmm. um, but Tom, you, you're really passionate that it's not just LinkedIn anymore. For some of the reasons you've already you, 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 you've already said, where else did you strike goal, and what kind of ROIs are, are we going to be talking about? Well, I mean, I've kind of answered this briefly. I sort of jumped ahead, uh, but I think the the Facebook 
conversation is you know we we look at meta and i know that we you know as marketers on this i'm sure you've had other people in parts of your business asking about why aren't we on TikTok and why aren't we here and why what are we doing with this? You know, so we've had an account on Instagram for three years, but no one's posting on it. What's going on? Um, I think it's easy to gravitate B2B to, to LinkedIn, and there is definitely a good reason for that. We know there's a very tailored audience there. We know we can target so specifically. You know, I might know the name of Mr. X at company Y. Um, I can't target him directly on LinkedIn with an ad, but I know that he is this role at this company. I've got a very good chance of nailing of nailing down um, an ad to him uh, if I if I do some campaign ads on on LinkedIn. But what we are seeing is that we know the audiences span multiple platforms now. We know that the age demographic of people moving onto multiple platforms is changing. You have more avenues and more areas with which to approach people. So focusing on a single platform isn't necessarily going to be the most valuable. Now, when we looked at Facebook for this, and we've done Facebook before, like we've done we've done Facebook for for campaigns a, a, a while ago, and I think we've brought them back now with the emphasis of focusing on purely video. And I know there's a question uh, in the comments about this, but the and I will come on to the comparison between um, imagery and carousels and, and, and video a little bit more. But the the essence with it was that we know that a lot of these platforms now video is king right and it doesn't matter if you're doing it on linkedin or any of the other platforms with facebook we knew we could duplicate that content across and not have to alter it because we know that it impacts those people we know the way we set it up it was cross-channel safe like it could be used in multiple ways right there's no adapting copy or visuals anymore we know we used to there used to be a, a time where everyone was like well you can't put the same copy out on facebook than you do on linkedin that's not really true you can do that but the main focus is obviously on targeting, right? We know that the targeting on Facebook is going to be a much wider net. We know we can't go as niche as we can on LinkedIn. However, based on your campaign budget, you can spend a lot less on Facebook and reach much, much wider. You can still, obviously, ever in changing way of meta. Meta is always, I think, for some people, I think it's I think it's Marmite from a lot of people, meta, but there is um there's there's ways of reaching all of these all of these people and more you're casting a wider net you're gonna get some flotsam and jetsam you're gonna get some maybe some clicks and some engagements that don't necessarily correlate with who you're looking for but again i, I come it comes back to the fact that if you are seeing these engagements and you are seeing this interaction and you are seeing the results and you're seeing the very low cost per clicks in the in in you know below a pound and all that stuff then you know that it's you know it's performing right so if you think about a, a large company that sells a product into multiple verticals or even there is perhaps a B2B to C element, um, think of these people as, as saying, well, this is, this is brand awareness. We come back to ROI again, right? If we're thinking about Facebook and we're saying, well, we want to generate leads through this. And I know that Facebook's working on that, on that at the moment. But if we're thinking about, well, we want website clicks and we want this and we want that, Facebook's a great way to generate awareness. And awareness is the pinnacle of good advertising right at the beginning of a nudge nurture strategy for all you know that person at some way down the line is going to see something related to what your company sells and it could be pivotal um it's just about having multiple ways of targeting those key people uh, which which you want to target which you know you can it's hard to be prescriptive but it's also reaching those wider people that you might not necessarily have been able to on on, on linkedin um, and that goes of, I'm just going to interject, Tom. So there's a couple of questions, and one of them is really uh, pertinent to this this conversation. So the Queso Essential question: How important is video in social compared to imagery and carousel? Katie's absolutely right. But that that nudge nurture piece that I uh, we spoke about in the middle, get your your animations in there. Whether it's a podcast or a, a filming talking heads piece you're doing, that content can be flipped out into audiograms. It can be. Yeah flipped out into statements um, and carousels, whether still or animated, make huge impact in social. That should be part of your content bundle. Awesome. Definitely do that. Tom J. Ola, I hope I pronounced your surname correctly. I'm really pleased you asked this question. Does Meta still apply to service-based businesses or mainly product-based? Right, Th there is an urban myth that Meta is not for B2B businesses. And I take pleasure in going to stakeholders and convincing them that, that they've been caught up in this myth. 
I'm going to show you on the ticker tape below some data which um, uh, adds uh, credence to what I'm about to say. So we had a 16 by 9 um, video. So this is a normal uh, video shot, put it into LinkedIn. The run rate was about 1% click through rate, which if you look at industry statistics for organic content, you will see that's actually at the upper end of what LinkedIn tell you is reasonable um, performance. We then took the same film published as vertical into LinkedIn and just that one format change, it doubled click through rates, reduced cost per clicks by 58% and quadrupled engagement compared to the performance on the 16 by nine. To answer your um, question though, what gets really exciting is when we took the same vertical films that I've just told you about, published to a targeted audience on Facebook, CXOs within technology, engagement rocketed to over 11,000 with 766 link clicks and the CPCs plummeting to just 34 pence. We have applied a big um, channel strategy change for a lot of our enterprise businesses because of this data. And I go back to what I said at the start of the call. This isn't one video. This isn't one story that overachieved in, in a moment. We've been running this hypothesis across many campaigns for many months, different seasons. So uh, from the early part of the year, for those on a traditional fiscal year where 1st of April becomes a new budget year, we had content running through the February, March, April period. We then had content running through the, the B2B window when people have unlocked budgets and started to do stuff. We even ran content through the summer lean period when people tell us they're all off social and they're all holidaying. And then into the busy period we are, if you're a B2B operative right now, you know, it's event season, H2 is well and truly underway. And in fact, your eye is probably on your end of year targets now and how you fill all that up. But every business is doing this and every business is putting out content. But the majority of businesses are putting out rubbish content into LinkedIn. Hardly anyone is looking at data of where's, who are our target audience? Where are they active? What are the formats for those channels? And how can we go and create social first content using the insights and the intelligence that, that, that we've, we've got? And just to show you that it goes beyond what we're talking about, some of you are going to be really shocked by this. GWI data, again, CXO's technology, age 25 years up, spend more time on TikTok than they do on YouTube. And the, the demographic splits are at the, the, the bottom there. So then one of the questions we're now asking enterprise businesses is why are you putting your content on YouTube? Tom's answered one of the questions that's valid. If you've got an hour and a half film, YouTube is the place to go and put that. But again, the question we're now looking at, particularly around ESGs and CSR initiatives, why isn't that going into vertical video? Why isn't it going into TikTok? Why isn't it going into the meta channels in those formats? Because we've got data showing it absolutely kicks ass when it does it and brings you closer to your audience. Crap content, crap performance, no demand gen. Social first content packaged with the right, the, the, the right format makes huge inroads. Um, I, hope, um, I hope that's answered your um, your your question, uh, Tony. Um, Tom, where are we at? Well, let me get back to the, the questions because when I start talking and waffling and get distracted, I drag us in directions we're not supposed to go. Right? And the script writers are then thinking, ask that question, ask that question. Mm. Um, right, we're covered the demand chain. Why are we focusing on it when 75% out there are already doing it? Because they're not doing it well. Be better, be stronger, be bolder. Something Tom said to me off camera, which I, I do want to bring into this, is when to use gated content, because nearly every B2B company wants to put good content up on a landing page and put a form field behind it. But you're creating a barrier there. And one of the points that Tom makes in his nudge nurture philosophy is you've kind of got to give away a bit of content to hook people on the trust to drive the download. Or if you've got a crap layout on your landing page, it's, it's not going to work right, Tom. And, there's an argument for, you called it being generous, I think. Yeah, well, or sort of charitable. I mean, it, it's so, it's easy to look at um, lead generation as being like, you know, well, here's a campaign we want to run for a month where we'll gate some highly valuable PDFs that are either white papers or incredibly uh, interesting thought leadership articles or, or whatever else. 
Um, and that's fine, and it, and, it, and it can work. But I think what we're increasingly starting to see, and I think we've read about this in the last week, is that lead generation, in, in effect, trying to use lead generation forms on LinkedIn can be effective. But we're starting to see a little bit, perhaps a little bit of, of, of hesitation from the audience here. And that might be due to, I mean, again, we don't really know why, but it could be because there's a, they're receiving a lot at the moment, a lot. Um, we know of a campaign that we did recently where the lead gen form rate openings were, were brilliant, really, really good. In terms of the rate of percentage of opens, they were really, really good. But there was a barrier to download. And we, we know that from, and I probably don't have to tell other marketers this that are, that are watching, but yes, that you do have to give things up for free at the expense of maybe not getting that information. But ultimately, if you've got a valuable piece of content that builds that builds trust in your brand and, and allows people to learn about you and what you understand, then that, then they'll come back. They'll be there further down the line. You can use that four or five page white paper, which frankly, most of the time is not really interesting to read, but, you know, break it out. It's different animations. Into, uh, someone raised a question in the comments, carousels, right? You can use carousels. You can use animations. You can use different ways of breaking down this information and give it for free, right? And in your particular role, in your position, if you can explain a click or a, a like or a click through to a landing page or or a comment, you know, that that's not a physical lead. But if you can see who those people are, you can get an attraction, get an idea of, 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 of who's interacting and who is interested. And you can monitor performance based on that. Um, lead gen has its place. I think we'll look to try and fine tune what we do. We obviously know what we've seen, what we know with the B2B sector, okay, new financial year, April, May, busy, September, busy, October, busy, January, boom, we need to get everything out before the end of financial year. These are busy months within B2B. So always think about with your campaigns, how you're planning. Don't be afraid to take a, a risk. Don't be afraid to maybe push things a little bit later, start things a little bit earlier, right? B2B doesn't turn off during summer and it doesn't turn off during Christmas. It's a myth. You can take risks here and there, right? Don't be afraid to do things, um, not not full pelt, don't put 100% effort behind it, but test and learn is another thing I would suggest. Um, I always come this, back is where your, this is where your vertical video push came yeah, into yeah. play, right? because I, look, I, I, I'm going to be honest about it. Tom and I were talking meta and B2B probably a year, to, a year ago, and Tom was rightfully advocating some of the challenges with meta. Um, there was trolling going on. There, it, there was assertions of it being a toxic platform. And we had to listen to all of that and go and look at it and then look at the data. Is this still going to work or is this going to be brand damaging? The vertical video campaign we've run has had no trolling, right? Now, the interesting thing about it, yes, it's a targeted audience, but if it's good content that's informing and educating the audience and it's using vertical, so it's going full display on mobile, if you're putting 16 by 9 out on mobile, 16 by 9 now goes into a small block within the feed, within your mobile. I mean, I'm getting on now. I'm well into my, my late 40s. It's not too long before I'm going to need a microscope to be able to see some of that content in, in social. But by going vertical, you get the full display. The other yeah. tip I would encourage businesses to uh, not be fearful of is it's okay for that content to look consumer-like with the block text. Don't just put those boring um, uh, subtitles at the bottom that appear in in full. Somebody who does it really well, he, I mean, Bart, Stephen Bartlett. I mean, we've we known Stephen for, for many, many years when he intercepted um, social chain and the successes he he, he had um, growing that group together. More recently, he's become known as the Dragon's Den investor and all the great stuff he's doing with Diary of a CEO. His production on Diary of a CEO, you cannot knock it, but look at the block text that he's pulling apart. You'll see the same applications on Five Live Sport. Now, these are big platforms, but they weren't big platforms when they launched. They had to work hard for their audience. It was about serving meaningful content that connected with the audience that drove advocacy. So please, please, please use vertical video. But a question I'm asked all the time is, can I just take my existing video and flip it to ver vertical? The short answer is yes. But if it's a boring video and it wasn't edited or produced getting to provocative questions and provocative insights, it might underwhelm. When we produce 
and we go out and do shoots, um, we're always asked, what do we do differently to pure play video companies? Well, pure play video companies will use the rule of three. So what, what I mean by that on the screen now, if they're framing the rule of three, my head will appear either in position one, the middle or position three. And the same goes across the frame on a, on a horizontal as well. They will very rarely put you in the middle because it's a boring shot. They'll set you off normally here, occupying position one and two or three or four because it's a more interesting shot. But what happens when you flip that video to vertical, I suddenly appear like this on your mobile because the rotation of vertical crops in. So what we do when we film is we create some extra dead space on 16 by nine, but we make it look attractive if we're at an event. We might put a walkway here where you see people going past. So it's an interesting shot, but then when it's cropped in for vertical, you've got the perfectly framed vertical position. You absolutely need to think about that. And the other gem that Tom gave you at the top of the call, don't just run the story sequentially from how you start. Find the most controversial question or the kick-ass insight that was given. Open with that, shock people, then bring your branding in and then start with the story. Why is that branding point really key? Well, if you start with your branding on every asset, go and take a look at your social feed. What's it full of? Frame shots of your branding, thumbnails of your branding. And everyone thinks they've already seen the content or they skip past it because it's boring. Grab people's attention with your people, their insight, their intelligence. And go and show the world how great the collective intelligence across your business is. And you'll see magic things happen with the data. Right. Back to the questions. What am I missing, Tom? Um, budget. You wanted to ask about budget allocation. And it's yeah. always a, a, a juggle. How do you yeah, decide how did you, where to put your money? Yeah, how did you decide where to put your money, basically? Well, right now, on every campaign we are doing, we are putting a vertical filming line item in it where um, it gives us enough time where we can work with the customer to identify stakeholders that can participate we can um, work with them to understand how to um, present themselves and how to um, conduct themselves better in an interview. Then we get out on site and we film it as if it's live, end to end, candid conversation. I do host a lot for, for customers and I'm regularly asked why. It's a tall order getting somebody that can learn a script, being able to talk competently, and confidently to camera without getting nervous about it. But it, I've not met anyone in industry that if you stop them, ask them a question about their business, their product, their offering, their service, they give you an answer. It's about identifying the juicy questions and having the confidence to ask them the questions that CEOs are really caring about at the moment. The CEO knows he's got to look at AI, but the question that they're asking right now is, how does AI move my business on in my category? Is it going to drive market share or is it going to replace staff? Am I, am I um, from a staff perspective, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to be replaced by a robot? The answer is no, but you've got to give more than that. What are they going to be doing if you bring an AI in to automate some duties? How are their strategic minds going to be applied? What does that lead to? Where does the opportunity come from? Where does the value impact come from? The efficiency, the impact story has to be told, but it starts with having a real provocative question around the AI as a case in point. So we put a line item in for vertical. We then go and um, film it as if it's alive. We'll then go and edit it and flip, going back to one of the questions earlier, some of that content into audiograms, carousels, animations. Um, we'll even apply color treatments. So we have been putting black and white video um, content into social. It was Tom and our lead designer, Chantel's idea. The engagement went up again. Why? It looks different. It stands out. It draws attention. And then you get the, the resonance. So vertical video filming line item. And anyone that's got ESG messages or CSR messages, please connect with me afterwards. We have a dedicated offering coming out the ground at IF. And we believe we can take your CSR storytelling and your CSG storytelling to the next level with tangible metrics and engagement and having you use TikTok as well as your other metal channels. So please come and talk to us about that. We can turn things around very quickly for you. We then have a content production line item in, and you're going to need paid 
budget, the copywriting, obviously, in the content production, but then you're going to need paid media. Social media is a pay-to-play model these days. Anyone that thinks you can achieve demand gen through organic, oh, go and have a word with yourself because you can't. Less than 1% of your audience will see your good organic content. Your mediocre content is going to be even, even lower. But there are things that... Um, are good with organic. If you get more than um, a dozen people commenting on a post, you get little micro boosts and you can extend it a bit, but you're never going to drive double digit engagement metrics organically unless you're kickstarting attention with paid. But then balance your paid. Do not go and put it all into LinkedIn. At this time of year, if you're a professional services brand, you're doing well to get your cost per clicks between five quid and 10 quid. I've got some alarming stories I could share with you about um, server companies struggling to get cost per clicks under 15 quid. Why? Because the audience is being bombarded. They're super competitive. Everyone's going after the same keywords. Everyone's going after the same job titles, the audience. The content doesn't stand out because it's boring. You get penalized, your cost per click goes up. But if you put good content out, you can, as we've already shown, you can get those cost per clicks dropping by 58% and getting into a really good area with a high quality conversion. But if you then go into meta or other vertical channels with vertical content, you can get great efficiency. People sometimes say Facebook's not for demand gen. Maybe go and have a word with Zuckerberg and ask him why he bought a company that interfaces data straight into Salesforce now. So you can actually collect leads in meta, flow straight into your demand gen. Why did he go and buy a data insights company that sits in the back end that plugs into their, their mRobot machine? that actually uh, helps with the, the targeting for years. He has been building an offering in the, quietly in the background to go and compete with LinkedIn because LinkedIn has a reputation of being the corporate networking tool, right? But there are flaws with it. They were the last channel to bring live to market, even with the Microsoft power behind them. They were three years behind some other channels, really, really slow. The targeting, it's costly, it's expensive. You need big budget and you need good content to stand out. If you've got modest budgets, you've then got to look at how we can make it work smarter. So put a bit into LinkedIn, but put a big chunk into Meta to get the quality reach and do your touch points. Build a nudge nurture campaign. It is going to cost you. You're probably going to have to put 20 to 25 grand aside to run a campaign over an eight to 12 week period. But I promise you this, if you allocated the budget, did it how we asked, your marketing qualified leads and going through to your sales qualified leads will be better than anything you've got within social if you allow us to be bold with the content, incorporate vertical and ask your stakeholders some pretty juicy questions that all your audience are thinking. They just want somebody to be ballsy enough to answer it and have an opinion. And magical things will happen. If you then got data going back to your board showing how you've got incremental returns, Getting more budget to scale things will be easily done. But you can't shortcut this. You can't get great outcome on the cheap. Social isn't free. You might get lucky flipping a bit of content into social and it suddenly goes viral. But you are an anomaly rather than the, the norm, um, it, it's fair to say. And you probably need an external stakeholder to pull you away from where you get dragged to. We've got to talk about this message because that's an important offer. And we've got to talk about this service because... The board are saying that's where our numbers are going to come from in the next six months. Okay, great. But how do we talk about the problems in industry that are solved by your offerings rather than buy this product now? There are companies out there who are today publishing assets about computers and servers and with a buy now message. Put your hands up if you've ever bought a server based on seeing a flipping social post. Nobody has. It doesn't happen. It's wasted. It's boring. People scroll past, right? So stop, take a step back and look at some juicy stuff. And not only will you have more fun, but you'll have far more impact. Rant over, I'm sorry. Um, Tom, I might have just answered this, but one piece of advice for our CMO audience on social media and B2B like demand gen, what, what, what should they do? I guess kind of following on from what you just said, it's kind of hard to quantify. I mean, it's hard to, to reduce this into something that's not going to sound um, like I'm telling you what you already know. But 
I'm going to pick up a little bit on what you sort of alluded to there, CJ. We, we talk about LinkedIn and we talk about the audience talking about cost per click. Part of the reason the cost per click is high, if, particularly if we're looking in technology area or, you know, since post-COVID, the general cost of targeting to this audience has gone up. You know, we know that technology now, we're leaning on it more than ever. Hybrid IT, all of these elements, we're now leaning on them more than ever, right? So more companies are advertising to these senior people who are looking for these solutions. You've got a more crowded marketing uh, more crowded marketplace than you ever had before. So part of the move over to Facebook is if we go back even 10 years, you had marketing people or senior people who were really cynical about social. We said, I don't know why we need to do this. I don't know why we're on this. I don't know what it does for my brand. I don't know what it does for my company. We're now at a point where there's those same people or the people that have replaced them have now said, right, we have to be on social. And part of that leans on, oh, our competitors are all on social, right? A lot of the time your competitors are doing stuff wrong. So don't always learn from them. But there's a slow, there's a slow message that we're seeing here. One is, why do we need to be on social? Now it's okay. We do need to be on social. There's still a gap between how do we do it right? Okay. This is not PR. This is not editorial, right? You haven't got to pitch to a journalist. You haven't got to get everything. You know, you haven't got to dot the I's, you know, cross the T's, whatever. You haven't got to get everything perfect. Social is a blank canvas which you can use for a very minimal cost. And if you nail it, you're gonna do really, really well. Moving into what, moving on shortly from what um, CJ said, we've now got this area of cynicism around Facebook. Okay, I'm on LinkedIn. Our brand's on LinkedIn because it makes sense as a B2B brand. We don't need to be anywhere else. Again, you're a few years behind, it's wrong. You should be everywhere. You can be everywhere, provided you've got the resource and you've got the time and you've got the budget. We are seeing movements, particularly on Meta, where, as we see, Zuckerberg's doing things to try and pull that B2B element through. He has, whatever you think about him, Facebook has done, um, is still doing really, really well. And there is trepidation around the brand uh, around the brand itself and whether or not people should be using it. But I think from a B2B aspect, you've got a good chance here where you've got less budgets, where you're going to reach more people. Yes, there's still question marks over the targeting, but I think that's going to be rectified in the near future. Um, if I have to talk about another bit of advice, I know we're pressed for time. Um, just always think about um, what interests you. What, what do you see on social on a day-to-day -day basis that resonates with you? Do not think for one second, just because you've seen something funny on TikTok or you've seen something interesting on Facebook, that you cannot incorporate that into your day-to-day -day B2B role because you can, okay? No, you can't take that dog on a skateboard or no, you can't, you know, perhaps use a... a a turtle doing something weird that's a reach right but it, it doesn't matter because you remember it you remember it just do do something do something interesting do something fun and if it doesn't work then you don't do it again or you delete it or you or you try something different people do get married a little bit to marketing uh, to, to brand guidelines as well that is one of the other things that i know a lot of people watching this might feel a little bit like oh, but the guidelines say this guidelines are guidelines they're not rules so yeah. sometimes I would say, and some of the things we've tried to do in the last year or so is not break the rules, but find where there are no rules and then try and be a little bit fun with that and see how we can push the boundary. Because once it's out there and it performs, yeah, it matter. You've basically gone, well, look, it worked. So all I would say is, I know this is, I know this is probably going to sound lame, but just try and be brave. Like just try and push it, try and experiment and and just let and just try and insist that you try it and see how it does before anyone senior tells you you can't do it because you can address brand guidelines right you go buddy up with the the person responsible for it i bet that they're they're not being restrictive or their intent is not to be restrictive with you the minute they understand how guidelines should be applied differently on social when they get good impact they change the te the major technology brand that we've spoken to you about they're adding elements to their brand guidelines for this very reason. The head of brand knows me personally and will tell you that I've got form for constantly challenging what they do. But now she really appreciates the fact that we're challenging what we do because it's for the good of industry. It's never seen as a, a negative. We've got to get over that mindset of mm -hmm. stay away from the brand police because they're going to pull our campaign. You, you can bridge it, but be bold. I love that. Do we also consider Insta as part of the meta brand for B2B? Hell yes, Kato. Um, my view, and I've put this in a deck um, recently, Instagram, B2B content should be about people, personality, purpose, and phenomenon. What do I mean by phenomenon? 
the standout stuff your brand is doing or has done and how it's impact well 2019 we were at an industry event broadcasting live bell lawrence one of our directors she helped the major technology brand realize that instagram was a key channel for taking people behind the scenes of what was going on in their world and then it's become a key recruitment and people challenge channel for the brand since more can be done on insta but yeah short answer it should be part of the b2b mix but you've got to film vertical yeah and everything we were talking about you you absolutely have to be ruthless in making sure that your vertical content lives the 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 sort of guidance we've we've given you but again that's where you probably need an external partner a bit like when you go into a bbc studios when, whenever i'm in there there's a producer pulling me back to the the core questions and the core topic and the editorial agenda that we need to to, to live you need that partner pulling you back well the cto might want you talking about how we're going to drive market share on servers by 25 percent, but nobody out there gives a hoot about it but if your offering increases security by, I don't know, 30% and you've got blockchain technologies embedded in it, which is going to make it easier for secure documents to be shared. For example, let's talk about the challenge and the threat of sharing secure documents online mm -hmm. and what can happen when that goes wrong and why you need to have end-to-end -end security. For example, that's just me thinking on my head. We can apply this to every industry, professional services, uh, B to C, even uh, B to B to C. Uh, we've got lots of examples that we can can share with you. I'm sure you appreciate a lot of our data is behind stringent NDAs, as you would all sign if you engaged us working with us. But there are there's more that we can show you. We'll share with you on a one to one basis about how we're making impact. Paul Collier, I love hearing that. The fact that five years ago uh, you had a conversation with Katie. She's rarely wrong, by the way. It really frustrates me how. I, I don't know why I argue with her because she's always right. Five years ago, she was pushing straight to Facebook with you. You were a skeptic. Now you're seeing it completely different. Smart okay. people take a step back and reevaluate things and don't allow judgment to cloud them. Like I said, Tom wasn't on board with Facebook for very good reasons, but he looked at the data. He pursued what was needed. He looked at outcomes, ran tests and proves. Now he's one of our biggest advocates for B2B as a result. Gone full yeah, I think, I think following on just yeah i mean we're seeing we're seeing that shift now not just facebook but we're seeing instagram and tiktok becoming so much more part of the social conversation this is not a consumer conversation this is a person conversation right it doesn't matter whether you're b2b or b2c what do we know about these platforms they're visual and they're brief you've got to be video you've got to be you've got to have emotion you've got to get attention because you have less time than ever people's attention spans are shorter than ever Right. So hopefully they're not so short that you've managed to stay with us throughout this whole video. But they are they are to a point where you have to start being bolder and braver onto different platforms. And what we all know in the B2B area is that you've got five percent of your audience that are ready to buy now. Ninety five are not. And the ninety five are the ones that you want to get your hooks into now so that when they are ready to buy, who are they thinking about? And that's. That's what I'll um, end my segment on, CJ. But, you know, Cato, expect to see that flipped out into a carousel and appearing in social content very soon. I think Tom's just given our, us our closing quote there. Thank you all for watching. It goes without saying, this is just a snippet of what is happening within B2B and affecting the demand generation landscape at the moment. But th this is a really successful campaign, tangible data. If you would like to hear more and explore how this can apply to your brand, uh, Katie Howell, myself, Tom, we're all available. You can find us online um, or through our social channels. We're happy to talk to you about it. And if you are looking at pushing your ESG CSR agenda right now, please come and talk to me about Vertical. I believe we've got a means that will make it stand out significantly. And quickly, if you're up against time, time scales, we could probably get stuff done before Christmas. But uh, come and pick that conversation up with me separately. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for the comments. Let me just check. There hasn't been another one. No, there's only been compliments. That's lovely to hear. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you again very soon.